If you're anything like me, writing slow music can often be far more challenging than writing fast music. This used to really be the case for me at the beginning of university, but over the last few years I've learned a number of things that have helped me have a much easier time writing slow music than I had previously, and I'd really like to share these tricks and ideas with any developing composers who might benefit from them. We'll also have some help from a few other composers throughout the video. Now, I just want to say as a quick aside before we start, it's not an objective truth that writing slow music is more difficult than writing fast music, but it has been my experience that more developing composers voice this particular concern than anything to the contrary. And even if you find writing slow music to be quite easy, perhaps there's still a chance that this video can be of some use to you, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Let's start. So first we have to ask the question, why is slow music challenging to write? It largely comes down to the fact that in slow music, there's nowhere to hide. What I mean by that is when you're writing fast music, some of the things that we value in Western European classical music can be cheated, and it might not even be noticed by the casual listener. For example, if your harmonic language is lacking, it seems to matter much more in slow music than it does in fast music. If you slap down a 1-4-5-1 progression in fast music, lots of people are going to think nothing of it, but in slow music, it's going to be really, really difficult to disguise it, and the listener can more easily become blatantly aware of a lackluster harmonic progression. So does this mean that having a developed harmonic language is more important in slow music than it is in fast music? No. At least I don't think so. All it means is that it's harder to get away with in slow music. As previously stated, there's nowhere to hide the elements of your music that are lacking. This is one of the great things about trying to write slow music. It can very quickly expose your personal challenges and areas you might need to focus on as a developing composer. For a good example of what I was talking about with more interesting harmony, look no further than the famous Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber. Let's take a listen to the first four bars. Of course, this music requires more than just its unique harmony to succeed. We shouldn't neglect the importance of the melodic line in the first violins, but that particular element is more related to a point that I want to get to later. So harmony is one important element, but one that I personally think matters more is counterpoint, particularly rhythmic counterpoint, or polyphony. Most simply put, because slow music is so at risk of dying in the water, the independence of lines in your music will help it stay in motion and stay afloat. I do want to stress that I'm much more concerned with the horizontal elements of counterpoint rather than the vertical. And having good rhythmic counterpoint is actually one way that you can get away with having less interesting harmony, because having lines that gradually arrive to a sonority independent of one another actually makes those seemingly mundane harmonies much more interesting. Here are the opening bars of my string quartet number one, which I wrote about four years ago. I've altered the music so that there's no rhythmic counterpoint whatsoever, only the harmony. Let's take a quick listen. So that's fine, but it's really just a bunch of chords. The process to change the music from something completely uninteresting into what it actually is was as simple as blurring the bar lines and making it so that the harmonic changes were different for each voice. It's an incredibly simple way to keep the music moving. To make it so that it wasn't simply staggered harmony, I also added some vague quarter note motion. This made it so that there's never any rhythmic relaxation larger than that constant quarter note pulse that each voice consummately creates. Let's hear the real thing with this in mind. Also, sorry, the only recording I have of this right now is a version I recorded for all violas, but it's all the same notes, so it doesn't really matter. Here it is. So in this particular instance, each different line is pretty equally active, 
and this is also largely due to the fact that there still really isn't any melody to rely on for motion, but I'm going to talk more about that later. Blurring the bar lines and staggering harmonic motion is one way of maintaining rhythmic counterpoint and keeping your music from being stagnant, but what are some other ways? One really simple one is to have a continuous melodic line that gets exchanged between voices and never stops until the end of a section. This is wonderfully demonstrated at Rehearsal 1 in George Walker's lyric for strings. As we listen, follow this continuous stream of eighth notes as it seamlessly crosses the entire ensemble. Notice how when any given line isn't serving as the melodic role, it's not even close to being as equally active as the line that is serving as the melody. Contrary to how the opening of my string quartet had no melody to drive it and needed equal activity from each voice, this section of the walker can rely on its melodic motion to keep it all moving, which was of course also the case for the barber. It relied almost entirely on that first violin line to move the music, the key word in that being almost. Notice how in the barber and the walker, the melody is the most prominent driving force, but there's still some slight motion and help from voices that aren't participating, and in the walker, it goes as far as to finally add two voices together, serving as equal melodic roles at the end of that section. These composers are very attentive to detail, and the way that they score is much more nuanced than just total equal polyphony, or simply melody and accompaniment. And this is why their music succeeds, because it breathes and it feels alive. It evolves as it progresses, and no one line is condemned to any one role. Yes, in Walker and Barber there's a clear melodic line, but it's those little motions in the less active roles that distinguish them from the works that are not as successful. These composers weren't lazy, and we shouldn't be either. To swing onto the other side of the spectrum from these examples, your polyphony can also lie largely in your more accompanimental material. This is particularly helpful if you have a melody that isn't a stream of the same note value like in the walker. Here's a quick example from William Grant Still's Summerland. So notice how even when the melody's at rest, the accompanimental material is still there to keep it moving forward. This is also a good example of how the pulse of the music is the real indicator of what is and isn't slow, rather than how you fill the space between pulses. Slow music can be slow while always still being in motion. Another great example of this in Still's music is the second movement of his Symphony No. 5. Now, I unfortunately don't have the score, but I would definitely go check out a recording. There's a constant pulse of what are most likely eighth notes throughout the entire movement, which almost never stop, keeping the movement always in motion. Gustav Mahler also uses this accompanimental method of propulsion in the third movement of his Symphony No. 4. The melody is extremely slow paced, but the pizzicato low strings keep it alive. So does all of this mean that homophony should never happen in slow music? Should the lines never move together? Well, actually, homophony can be a really great tool in slow music. It can be used to comfortably contrast extended sections of polyphony and rhythmic counterpoint, as in this example again from Walker's Lyric for Strings. This moment at Rehearsal 3 comes after around a minute and a half of polyphonic music and offers a wonderful moment of emotional pause before continuing to the next section of rhythmic counterpoint. Let's listen from a few bars before.
And notice how when the music is homophonic, the harmonic interest never lets up, and that is extremely important. Homophony can also be used to great effect for climaxes. Now perhaps the slow music you're writing doesn't necessarily have a climax, which is totally fine, but if it does, that can be a great place to use this tool. Remember my string quartet number one from a few minutes ago with its contrapuntal opening section? The climax of that very same movement is entirely homophonic, and there's no blurring of the bar lines whatsoever. It also just so happens that this climax erupts out of this polyphonic climb to the top. Let's listen from the accelerando. And if you look further into my music, you'll see many, many instances of this happening in my string sextets and saxophone chamber music as well. I think it's a really, really effective tool and works really well with my harmonic language. This sort of thing also happens at the climax of the Barbara Adagio, which is honestly probably where I first got the inspiration to start experimenting with it. Now, of course, there are other things at play here. Things like unnatural pacing and subpar melodic development can destroy slow music, but they can also do that to music of any tempo, so those will likely get their own videos. The issues discussed in this video were things that I've personally found have really pertained a lot to slow music, and so I wanted to share these ideas with anyone facing similar barriers. Now, if you were thinking during the part of this video where I was talking about uh, harmonic development, that that is something that you particularly struggle with, then I do have uh, two videos on developing your harmonic language that you can go uh, check out if you would like to. That's going to end off this video. Of course, there's always more that can be said, but once again, I'll leave some of those things for future discussions. I put a ton of work into writing and putting together this video, so please do hit the like button if you enjoyed it or found it useful, and uh, consider subscribing if you enjoy the stuff that I put out. I really, really do appreciate it.